Thank you, Brian. Um, just to add to what Brian said, thanking you all uh, for coming to uh, Levine to take part in, in this uh, workshop. It's a very important topic, um, but what my wife regarded as really quite a dry subject, um, but um, it's important, uh, and uh, I think we're all sharing as enthusiasts the different corners of our roles in the community and it's a very broad set of roles that we all represent um, covering the spectroscopic and microscopic techniques that impinge on understanding the arrangement and nature of atoms. Um, now the vision for the diffraction data deposition working group was that of the IUCR president of the time, Sine Larsen, who um, by a helpful coincidence was also a director of research at the European Synchrotron radiation facility in Grenoble. And uh, CNA and the IUCR executive asked me to, uh, with Brian to um, set up this uh, working group. So we've been active now for uh, four years and the renewal of the group uh, was agreed in Montreal um, and uh, Tom Terwilliger was here was uh, very much a mainstay uh, of helping with the proposal for uh, what we would do uh, within the uh, current uh, triennium. As well as Brian thanking the sponsors um, and the Croatian Association of Crystallographers, um, I think just also to bring out the point of CODATA, which is within the International Council of Science, um, that there, as a research community, we rub shoulders with um, all the other scientific communities interested in data, which is pretty much most of them. And alongside the astronomers and the particle physicists, uh, crystallographers can rightly hold their uh, head high and chest out with respect to doing a good job with respect to um, access to processed uh, structure factor data and the derived coordinates. And it's a natural thing that we should then turn our attention to the very technically challenging uh, in terms of data storage, the raw uh, data. Um, so the, the wider context is very much uh, looking at what we do as one of the leaders in the world of scientific data. So by way of uh, this short presentation, uh, to try and capture uh, the essence, um, and first of all, the philosophical view of the importance of access to raw diffraction data. Namely, to provide uh, the user and reader of research results, uh, the publication obviously, uh, and the database deposition, uh, but also to provide uh, the user with the chance to see through their own eyes uh, and not the lens of somebody else. Uh, and that, I think, it, it is uh, a point of philosophy that we would all uh, respect and adhere to, adhere to. I will then give, a, uh, within that headline, a, a brief recap of the first triennium. And um, actually, I've chosen uh, as the simplest way of giving you the agreed statement and the approved by the uh, IUCR statement, the report that I made to the IUCR Montreal General Assembly. And that's where all the different adhering countries to IUCR are assembled. Um, and so it was obviously an important presentation. I've mentioned already the challenge of the sheer volume of our raw diffraction data. And in the uh, generic terminology of big data, I think we can firmly say that we qualify for the sort of big data challenges that are highlighted for uh, a number of different fields, but also in, in the commercial and business area. The challenge of achieving uh, and satisfying the new user to raw data, uh, to be able to appreciate in depth the raw diffraction data, the metadata uh, description is absolutely critical. Um, basically, can a new user successfully understand and process any raw data uh, that he or she wishes to analyze? And that, of course, is the, the core point um, of this uh, workshop. The raw data without the process structure factors and the coordinates 
as may well be the case, is then a distinctly different situation where you have no uh, chemical knowledge at that point. Now, of course, the reanalysis of coordinates and structure factors via the raw data, you are guided by the original researcher's view of the chemistry. Um, but where there might be situations of the raw data without the process structure factors and the coordinates, the only knowledge of the nature of the study will be the sample name. And therefore, I press upon you that the need to uh, provide sample name with raw data will be paramount. It's an obvious point, but it may not uh, be properly captured. And of course, within that, the naming and the IUPAC and IUBMB nomenclatures for chemistry and biology naming of compounds and samples will have to be respected. So, if we think about the uh, raw data pyramid, which is at the top right, uh, I this is the laser pointer. Uh, here, this is a, a logo, which I hope many of you will be familiar with, but the raw data, the process data, and the derived data, and the challenge of the volume is very much at the bottom of this pyramid, and it's easier with the size of files at the top. So the raw diffraction images um, offer a variety of opportunities, but they are offer uh, this challenge of the storage. Now, our keynote opening speaker, Lars Kroon Backenberg uh, from Utrecht in the Netherlands, <coughs> will give uh, a more detailed version of this, so I won't dwell on it. <coughs> but these uh, simple uh, statements here provide a checklist of the uh, opportunities that raw data presents for uh, working at either higher resolution, uh, trying to improve methods of analysis, um, checking those early steps of the analysis, which means for us the symmetries of the crystals, the possibility of multiple lattices, and of course the diffuse scattering which may be between the diffraction spots. Um, the investigator whose focus would be on the Bragg diffraction, of course, may not have optimized the diffuse scattering conditions. And so uh, some alerting that the diffuse scattering here may be of interest and a more optimal measurement uh, might be appropriate uh, will be the sort of topics that might wall leader in diffuse scattering interpretation who's with us here uh, will no doubt go into. And of course, we're well familiar with the benefits of retaining uh, derived data, the databases, uh, been very successful uh, over the decades and um, are listed here and we'll have presentations uh, from Susanna Ward from CCDC um, and by remotely from John Westbrook uh, with the PDB. Um, but the, uh, the whole uh, suite of, of benefits uh, from this clarity of the scientific record um, are listed here. Um, I think are well known uh, to you and, and uh, will be stressed by Susanna and John. And the um, process data, the structure factors, over the years, uh, most famously, we've had the Dick Marsh uh, thrust with the uh, space group corrections uh, through having the uh, structure factors, um, and we have Tom Terwilliger's vision for the continuous improvement of uh, macromolecular crystal structures, and Tom also is, is here at the uh, workshop. Um, and so, um, again, we have these distinct uh, benefits from the returning of the process data. So, these are more familiar to us, uh, the role of coordinates and structure factors, um, but there's still an ongoing evolution of how we might better uh, use um, the information that we, we've preserved for a considerable time, in addition to the new opportunities that the raw data presents. So that is a try and, an attempt to capture the philosophy of why this is important as an, an initiative, and why the president of the IUCR, Sina Larson, gave it the priority um, uh, that she did. So after three years, um, I was invited by the new president uh, Marvin Hackett to present uh, to the 
General Assembly, and this, this is a few slides um, uh, that I presented to them. And so as a working group, and I'll uh, list the membership shortly, uh, we had made recommendations to the Executive Committee for the upcoming triennium, and the, the IUCR commissions, uh, if they had not already done so, um, should define their metadata carefully. And publications uh, in uh, IUCR journals from the uh, EXAF's commission and the Small Angle Scattering Commission um, had really led the way uh, for those techniques. And uh, through the leadership of Lois Kroon Battenberg uh, for single crystal work, um, we've made our own uh, particular research interests, recent research interests, uh, uh, and uh, Lowe's uh, is the corresponding author on a paper in Journal of Applied Crystallography on metadata for single crystal work. Now, a new proposal was to, uh, from the working group, was to introduce a difficult raw data section to uh, probably Journal of Applied Crystallography, um, and this would invite um, authors who measured data but had failed uh, to uh, solve structures um, to uh, share them with the, the wider uh, community. Um, and th that uh, suggestion uh, is, is with the um, uh, section editors of J. Apple Christ. We could have um, a uh, centralized crystallographic repository of um, raw data set metadata. Um, and that would be particularly uh, led from Chester, um, uh, including a, a web search interface. And that could lead to a pilot um, service. Um, and within that uh, is embedded the notion that perhaps the easiest way for the archiving of raw data is to hold them closest to where they were measured. And so um, the chance for making available raw data either through the university library or the synchrotron or the neutron source um, where the uh, data were measured via a DOI uh, link to each data set um, could then make uh, within the metadata registry um, at least a centralized and coordinated effort to define uh, raw data sets. So this is a modus operandi which is trying to be pragmatic without the immediate funding of uh, the centralized databases. Um, now, the issues that we listed for the IUCR, um, uh, because we are in the big data category, although not at the level of the biggest data uh, generated uh, is around, which is this radio astronomy square kilometer array radio telescope project. Nevertheless, we are in the big data framework and we may have to consider subsets of data retention or limited time periods for the retention. And of course, that uh, need of a practical nature may take quite some time to discuss uh, what will be uh, retained. Uh, or what might be a respectable time period for retention. Secondly, we have the uh, question of rights of access to publicly funded but unpublished research data. Um, and uh, where taxpayers are paid, then the rule in things like space science um, is that the research data um, have to be made available after three years. Um, and it might not be our decision in the end, it might be forced upon us um, when research data must be made available more widely, published or not. So that could certainly uh, develop into an issue for discussion was our feeling within the working group. So for the first three years, here were the uh, people who uh, agreed to serve that were approved by the IUCR executive and it represents global coverage um, and also uh, the necessary range of uh, techniques within the purview uh, of the IUCR. And I think these names are well known to you and with um, Salguna wish to uh, 
bow out of the working group, um, Dorothea Sibeni, also from Cornell, um, has stepped in um, to represent um, the facilities, synchrotron facilities in particular, and, and chess, of course. Um, Dorothea is leading the Mac Chess um, centralized unit at Cornell. Now, in terms of developments of the last year, um, one thing caught my eye, um, and that was the uh, 8th of July issue of Nature, which highlighted that there was a change of view from the funding agencies uh, towards the use of the cloud for storing vast scientific data sets. And basically, there had been opposition to letting commercial providers of data storage have um, the responsibility for uh, hosting uh, raw data, um, and in particular, uh, data for genomics analysis. And so this change of uh, view of the research funders, I thought, uh, was particularly uh, interesting. Um, and uh, one of our consultants, Herbert Bernstein, who will present remotely also within this workshop, uh, had always stressed to us the, uh, the possibilities uh, for data storage via the cloud. So we, here we are, um, the next step of the working group activities uh, is this workshop and so uh, it's the role of Brian and I to uh, make clear the work that you're about to do in these two days so this is a go to it uh, type of list. Um, so we wish you to define your metadata uh, when you speak or at least define the challenges that you face in reaching that uh, level of maturity of statement on your metadata. We've even provided a template form for you to supply information about metadata for your scientific research field or IUCR commission. Um, we are very conscious of course that um, we don't need to reinvent certain types of metadata, and so the uh, aligning of scientific metadata with the gene generic standards like the, whoops, the Dublin Core sorry, um, of metadata descriptors, of course, we would follow. And I come back to the first point. The whole mission here is to uh, allow the seeing of a data set through a new user's eyes and to facilitate that process. Um, and we will have to take part in understanding each other's fields, whether it's diffraction, spectroscopy, or microscopy, because all of those are involved in understanding the arrangement of atoms. So, this is our workshop sessions list. Um, we're in the introduction uh, session, and we'll move into session two, diffraction images, Session three, metadata for diffraction images and other methods. Session four, data in the wider world, uh, from laboratory to database. Session five, what new metadata items are needed. And session six, metadata schemas. And we have a sort of practical uh, session, uh, which James Hester will lead, who's flown in from uh, Sydney and is looking remarkably dapper for having done uh, some 30 hours of flying on yesterday. Um, other than that, let's go to it. Thank you. And we have a question from Tom Twilliger. Um, could we have to follow? There is a process here. Could you um, pass Tom the microphone? Because of the web stream, uh, whenever you wish to answer, ask a question, we'll use the microphone. So if you could say who you are and where you are from for the benefit of our remote listeners. Okay, so this is an excellent question. So that the whole training and education aspect um, is a potentially looming elephant in the room. So the new user's eyes um, 
I think I'm implicitly assuming would be sufficiently expert um, to know what they were about um, and therefore a qualified um, crystallographer. Um, and I'll have to define what I mean by a qualified crystallographer. Um, I think we have, first of all, an easier challenge than the particle physicists who are also very enthusiastic about open data. And in fact, because of the sheer number of co-authors on their publications, probably the only people that could be qualified as particle physicists to understand are probably co-authors on that anyway. Um, so they've also been wrestling with this question of, well, yes, we can make the raw data available, but, you know, they didn't quite use the term, what's the point? Um, but all the people that could look at it are part of the team. Um, but anyway, come back, in, come back to ourselves. Um, what if the crystallographer isn't that well qualified, looks at the raw data and doesn't uh, process it properly? So I think the whole thing of the continual professional development of our field and the role of the uh, national and international associations could be improved a lot for providing uh, skills workshops uh, within our conferences. Um, I was chairing the BCA at York this year and with the program committee we introduced through the whole day a parallel session which was skills workshops for CPD. Um, so uh, we can't in the end absolutely guarantee qualified crystallographer who uses eyes can get into the raw data, but we, we could do an improved job with that. John, you, you made a very important point about giving access to people to the data which people couldn't use, at least for structural determination. Yes, and you proposed three or five years. What I found, that even after 10 years, people still hope to solve the structure, and they are very unwilling to let others to look into that. Because these projects, after 10 years, they are not so important. They are usually not funded, so they do not lose anything not giving you the data. On the other hand, if people have something hot and they need this data now because the grant renewal is closed, they are doing anything to get that structure. So, so this is a comment from Vladek Miner from the University of Virginia in the US. Um, so the three to five years, uh, I think I prefaced by the, the EG, EG um, and was not a proposal, it was a statement of fact as to what other uh, communities actually adhere to. Um, I could have also mentioned, but didn't, um, something that Simon Coles reminded us about at Warwick, um, which was that the uh, EPSRC have a rule which is that the data should be retained for, uh, is it 10 years, Simon, after it was, yeah, so potentially you could have, you know, sort of 15 to 20 years for the retention period. I think the point that we're wrestling with under that particular issue um, is uh, we might need to uh, triage the matter of what data we retain. Uh, it might not be possible to retain everything in perpetuity. Um, and we're going to have to be somehow sympathetic to the initial period at least, um, allowing uh, some restriction of, of how many or for how long uh, that people make raw data available. But as a working group, we actually don't have a, a, a proposal other than to try and make um, available how people might make that raw data available, save the data near to where you measured it, get DOI uh, information assigned um, through the institution, um, and basically we are championing the benefits of, of retaining raw data. Um, so maybe 
the point that you're making is we should perhaps not be quite so sympathetic to the difficulties and just say, as a working group, it ought to be done. Time to Williger again. So, as a practical matter, how have other communities dealt with the question of what data are worth or are important enough to make available? So just for example, in macromolecular crystallography, 99% of data sets are worthless, I exaggerate slightly, and but basically there are many data sets collected that are not worth looking at because they're collected badly. So surely we don't want to require people to make those available because they're not interesting. However, we would want any well-collected data to be permanently available to the world somehow, and that does seem like a great idea. So how do other communities deal with that question? So the biggest challenge is the square kilometer array, and they've decided that their data deluge is so great that they can't hope to retain raw data. And so they're only planning to retain processed data. Um, so that's one other community. Another other community is, is the particle physicists. And through the uh, International Particle Physics Research Centers, they're planning to use the cloud. So they didn't have the concerns over commercial usage, usage of commercial providers that the genomics uh, funders had. So there's two examples from um, astronomy and particle physics uh, about how they're trying to deal with the data deluge. But your question involves other points, which may be in the interest of time We'd better move on, but um... I'm sorry. There is a tremendous difference between astrophysics and, let's say, protein crystallography, because who is consumer of this data? The the real question is who is consumer of the of the data. In case of astronomy, there are astronomers. Yes, I mean uh, there, there are. Maybe some physicists can do that, but they, uh, these are these highly qualified people. In case of protein crystallography, consumers are biologists. Yes, and there is, I don't know, three orders of magnitude more biologists than really protein crystallographers. And this is the reason why what we are doing is so important uh, and why we have so much more funding than other uh, fields because our uh, consumer, consumers of our research is really a very large group of people. So I think that we should think about consumers, not about necessarily about us. Quite so. Uh, what I would say on um possibly predicting who might be the users of raw diffraction data, raw spectroscopic, raw microscopic data, versus the processed and derived existing uh, database information that's available. Um, it may be the case that it would be the crystallographers who would be the ones predominantly looking at raw diffraction images, um, whereas the biologists, let's take them as an example, would be more still looking at the PDB um, information. But that's only my, my guess. Um, in terms of the relevance of other communities, I think we should take uh, some note of what they're doing and the challenges that they face. But I agree with you that the situations are different. The night sky is, is open access. Somebody makes a sample, there is IP. And they make measurements on it. So there are interesting points of, of difference at the core of the being of astronomy versus the core of the being of crystallography. On those notes of philosophy, I propose that we move on, uh, otherwise we'll be so badly out of timetable for the, those outside the room. Um, so, shall I introduce Lars Grimbattenberg, who's our keynote speaker, um, and um, uh, Lars is from the crystal and structural chemistry uh, section of the Biofoot Bio Centre for Biomolecular Research in UK.